Robert Welch, hero or heretic. We're facing a very dedicated enemy against our people that masquerades under the name of communism or communists. This is the great name that they use and actually hides their true identity. But Robert Welch is the founder of an organization called the John Birch Society, as most of you know, whose purpose is to fight the communists. And I want to read some things that he has written and to discuss some things out of the scripture and see if I can help a great host of American people who know something about this organization, know something about this man, to find out whether Robert Welch is actually a hero or a heretic. And I think the question can be answered from the Bible. We have heard from so many people who are members of the John Birch Society, and uh, the great question always comes up, if you're a Christian, do you associate with non-Christians? As Robert Welch admits that he is not a Christian, he never declares himself as a Christian, even for good purposes, supposedly for the good purpose of saving the United States from conquest. Turn over to the fifth chapter of Ephesians, and we'll read some scripture, and then I want to read some statements by Robert Welch to decide and help people decide just what their duty is as a Christian in relation to this kind of effort to eliminate or stop what is called world communism. In the fifth chapter of the letter to the Ephesians, Paul writes in the 13th verse, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. In other words, reproved or discovered. Whatever it is that's reproved or discovered is discovered by the light. We apologize for the missing audio in this portion of Pastor Emery's sermon. The scripture continues from Ephesians 5, verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Evil or good, it has to be discovered by the light. Uh, you know from your own physical senses that if you hear a noise in your house at night, and it sounds like a burglar, you don't know whether it's a burglar or not until you go in the room and turn on the light and see the man. The very sound is not evidence that uh, so-and-so is a burglar. And uh, I'll just give you an example of the proof of that by an incident that happened to some friends of our son and his wife not too long ago, about six months ago or so, the man heard something in his house at night. All the lights were out. It was absolutely totally dark. And uh, he got up with a gun to investigate and uh, he went through the rooms, didn't find anything, including the bathroom, but when he came back by the bathroom, he heard somebody in the bathroom. No light on in there. And uh, he jerked the door open and fired his gun into the bathroom and shot his little boy right through the mouth. Luckily, praise the Lord, it knocked out a couple, three teeth, and of course left quite a wound on both sides, but it did not hit the bone or the jaw or the head or anything. Now, that man was absolutely and totally convinced in his mind that there was a burglar in that bathroom. But it was dark. There was no light there. He couldn't see. And, of course, he inadvertently... Now, this was a tragic thing, but this is just an example of the uh, reasoning or the reason that God and His Word is called light. You have to have the light in order to prove what something is, whether it's good or bad. Turn back to um, Psalm 119. And uh, you know this um, very well. It's quite a familiar uh, verse, 105. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word is the lamp and the light. And verse 130 says, The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. So we believe that Paul, of course, in Ephesians was talking about that idea that the light would come from God in order to reprove or discover things. You'd have to have this light from God, just as you have to have a physical light to identify something in the physical universe. In the sixth chapter of Proverbs, in verse 23, it says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. The way of life are actually reproofs of instruction. In other words, instruction and light from the Word that shows you right and wrong, good and evil, who's right and who's wrong, who might be a hero or a heretic, can be shown by the Word of God. 
And uh, I do not believe that anyone can turn to such a subject as controversial, is the term they use, as the uh, John Birch Society and its fighting of world communism, and find out whether it's good, bad, or indifferent except by the Word of God. And from correspondence that we receive, people often are trying to make up their minds about things going on in the world today by their own knowledge. And uh, we hope this morning to be able to show them that they can use the Word of God to prove whether Robert Welch is a hero or a heretic. Turn back to the Ephesians again. In uh, verse 15 it says, uh, chapter 5, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. You know, we're on a radio station here locally, as you know, that has many other uh, Christian broadcasts. Almost all of them are ministers for music and so on. And uh, I heard a man on uh, that station make a remark one day which I thought was very good. Why is it that we tend to be given the idea that Christianity is for hillbillies and men who can't say anything but ain't. You ever think about that? <laughs> Most of the ministers that claim they and only they are filled with the Spirit of God are the ones that say fur and ain't and so on. Now, this is not true of every radio station, and many of these men are quite educated and so on. But Christians are supposed to be wise not foolish, not dumb, not uh, lacking in intelligence, but wise. And some people have the erroneous idea that if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be just foolish and ignorant and unlearned and so on. You're not supposed to show any wisdom of the world because they're fearful that any wisdom that you show must come from the world. Therefore, you should be ignorant or else you can't prove you're a Christian or have the Spirit. But Paul says... You get the light, you get the word, you understand it, and that word will make you wise, will make you full of wisdom. I see someone brought back that book that uh, we had out here. Any of you might want to read it again. It's, um, I've forgotten the title, but it's a National Geographic book about those Americans and their inventions or something like that. And as you read the book, you'll recognize that the names that you know in there, for practical purposes, these men who invented these tremendous things in America were not necessarily learned from the universities, but they were learned from the Word of God. They were wise in the Word of God, and God gave them the wisdom for inventions. And we could prove that from the Word, but we won't go into that this time. But I want to read something out of the Blue Book, statements by Robert Welch, and then we're going to go back and forth in the Scripture, and you follow with me, and you see whether there is light in which one has the light, and what is revealed by the light of God's Word from the statements made in the Blue Book of the John Birch Society. Now, this book is actually the compilation of the speeches made by Robert Welch on December 9th of 1959 when he organized the John Birch Society. On page at one says, with short breaks for coffee, for luncheons, and for brief discussions in between sections of the presentation, it required the two whole days to set forth the background, methods, and purposes of the John Birch Society. The pages that follow are simply a transcript, practically verbatim, of that presentation. And this is given out as the official, or the more or less official, thoughts and ideas of Robert Welch upon which the John Birch Society is founded. Its purposes and aims and uh, philosophy are all given in here. After about 50-some pages of detailing, at least to some extent, and mind you, at that time, he was speaking to men who were quite cognizant of the communist menace. So the 50 pages are rather brief, running over the entire history of the last approximately 50 years of the infiltration and conquest of parts of the world by communism. And then it comes to section 3, titled, And Deeper Still, and I think this is a rather intriguing title, as you'll see as I read from this chapter. Now, gentlemen, in looking thoroughly and realistically at the danger to everything we have inherited, spiritual as well as material, and at the cause of that danger, we come to the second of the fundamental reasons for deep and basic anxiety. 
And putting that matter bluntly at once, the reason is simply loss of faith. Not just loss of faith in God and all his works, but loss of faith in man and his works too, in his reasons for existence, in his purposes, and in his hopes. Now I know that there are still millions of devout Catholics, fundamentalist Protestants, and faithful Jews in this country who still believe unquestioningly in the divine truths and powers which their Bibles reveal to them and whose conduct and relations with their fellow men are guided strictly by the precepts of their religious faith, or who at least feel they have sinned whenever they have transgressed such precepts as understood by their consciences. I have hundreds of good friends in those categories, including some in this room. In other words, Robert Welch is saying he knows in America there are devout Catholics, fundamentalist Protestants, and faithful Jews, and they number among his best friends. Now he says this, goes right on, Let all of us thank whatever God we severally worship that there is so large a remnant of the really true believers still left. We honor them. We need their steadying adherence to the rock of reverence and their aspiration of unwavering obedience to the ancient and divine commandments. In other words, Robert Welch at the very founding of the John Birch Society states, we need people who worship some God, any God, whatever God they worship, who follow the precepts of whatever God it is that they worship, <laughs> and whatever God they worship in His commandments, and we want to get them in here and we're going to use them to fight communism. So in the very founding of this organization, he has stated specifically, we want people who worship any God, some God, whatever God, and who obey ancient and divine commandments. And of course the question then is ancient and divine commandments of who? Turn with me over to Isaiah 43. And these are uh, quite familiar verses I'm sure to most of you. And I'll just pick out a few here in some, sev some several chapters of Isaiah. Isaiah 43 starting in verse 10 through 13. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be any after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared, and have saved, and I have showed, when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? The next chapter, Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 8. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God, and who, as I, shall call, and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Now this is what the Bible said. Isaiah 45 and verse 5, he says, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Fifth verse of the next chapter. To whom will you liken me, and make me equal, and compare me, that we may be like? This is a condemnation, actually, of these uh, chapters all the way through, about five or six chapters here, of Israel, who apparently were beginning to think that there were other gods, or other gods like him. And God says, who are you going to compare me to? There's no other god. He says, I don't know of any. None before me, and there will be none after me. In the 48th chapter, he says, I have declared the former things from the beginning, and they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them, I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. Because I knew that thou art obstinate, and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow brass, I have even from the beginning declared it to thee. In other words, God has foretold everything that is going to come to pass. Lest thou shouldest say, Mine idol hath done them, and my graven image and my molten image hath commanded them. Thou hast heard, see all this, and will not ye declare it? 
In other words, Israel, you have seen all these things that I've done. I've declared the former things from the beginning. I have made them come to pass. Won't you declare it? Do you refuse to declare it? Now, well, it says in here that we need the, un the steadying adherence to people who worship whatever God it is that they worship and who follow the commandments, I assume, of whatever God it is that they worship. And I'll show you as we go along that he goes on a little further. In the next page of the blue book, on page 58, he says, <clears throat> The true fundamentalists in our midst, whether Catholics, Protestants, or Jews, are the moral salt of the earth and of an increasingly savorless earth where such salt is like a stream of clear water in the desert. Now he says, Catholics, Protestants, and Jews are the moral salt of the earth. Turn with me over to Matthew 5. In verse 13, Christ is speaking, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. He is saying to these men he's speaking to, Ye are the salt of the earth. And in uh, verse 1 and 2, it is identified he is speaking to his disciples. In other words, as far as we're concerned and from this passage, Christ is saying the disciples of Christ are the salt of the earth. It doesn't say anything about anyone else. In uh, Mark 9, ninth chapter of Mark, we have the salt brought up again in verse 49 and uh, 50. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, wherewith shall ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. Now isn't that a strange thing for Christ to say to Christian people, you have salt in yourselves? He told the disciples they were the salt of the earth, and then he turns around and tells Christians, believe it, that you have salt in yourself. And I want to show you how far-fetched this idea is that non-Christians are the salt of the earth, especially whether they're Jews or Catholics or whatever they are. If they're not believers and disciples of Christ, of course, they can't be the salt of the earth. But to help you understand Mark 9, where Christ is telling them to have salt in them, and he's telling us, have salt. Turn back to Leviticus 2, and this is the law. And, of course, this is the great problem we run into with people trying to understand the New Testament without reading the Old Testament. Second chapter of Leviticus, starting in verse 12. As for the oblation of the first fruits, ye shall offer them unto the Lord, but they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering, with all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. Three times in this one instruction in the law, God makes it very plain that the meat offerings were to be salted. Always, everyone had to come with salt. Now, if you realize that the meat offering to the Lord that Israel was to make was to be salted, you'll understand what God says when he says, you're supposed to have salt in you. In other words, if you are to be a true Christian and an offering unto the Lord, which you are, you are to be salted, the same as the law required the meat offering to be salted. Now, I would have you think with me for a moment on this same idea. God Almighty, according to John 3, 16 and 17, died for the salvation of the individual, for the redemption of the individual, and to save the world. Now, the world is corrupt and without savor in the sight of God. You know what makes the world acceptable to God? The salt of the earth. Christians. What did Christ say in Matthew 24? That unless those days were shortened and no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. God will save the world because of what? Because of the salt in it. The Christian people. God is not saving the world because of the Jews are in it. He's not saving the world for the unbelieving Catholics who pray to the Queen of Heaven. Most of you know that the Pope just recently announced 
that all the Catholics should pray to Mary. Well, there is a religion called the religion of Babylon and Baal worship in which the people prayed to Tammuz, the queen of heaven. And many Catholics don't know that when they're asked to pray to Mary, they are actually going through the ritual of the old Babylon religion. And yet Robert Welch says, The true fundamentalists in our midst, whether Catholics, Protestants, or Jews, are the moral salt of the earth. You notice how he takes scriptural precepts and uses them to fit people that God says they do not fit. And this was at the very founding of the John Birch Society. All right, on the next um, page, I've got several pages. I've got so many pages marked in the blue book here that um, I know from looking at the clock that we're going to go into this on next week. But as I say, I want people to understand this is being done specifically so we can look at this situation and this John Birch Society and these people using the light of God's Word in order to find out the truth about it. He goes on in another page here and tells how many people in the churches, in all churches, are falling away from the faith. And then he says, It may shock the Protestants among you to have all of these things said out loud, but you know in your hearts that they are true. It is also true that while later, perhaps slower and not yet so far advanced in some of these cases, the same trend of worldly disillusionment and loss of true faith is visible among Catholics, among Jews, among Muslims, among Buddhists, and among the formerly devout believers of every great religion of the world. And Robert Wells presents this as this being a tragedy, that people are no longer true believers in Buddha, <laughs> and they are no longer true believers in the Muslim faith, and there are no longer true believers among the Jews. He puts the word true believers to fit Catholics, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, and, quote, every great religion of the world. Do you understand the error that you can see? I'm only on page 59, by the way, of a approximately 180-page book, and the beginning of his presentation in the forming of the John Burt Society. And um, I wrote this out here so that I would say this just right, because I'm going to repeat this a couple times. And I want you to listen very carefully, to go through the Word of God with me, and to consider this situation that we have, and our good godly Christian people, many of them are Christian, who are in the John Birch organization. And as we go on, you will recognize that the main goal, and I'm reading this because I'm going to read it again next week if I continue on this, the main goal of Robert Welch's organization is to unite diverse people under one slogan, anti-communism, and then mentally condition them to accept any religion or any god or any profession of such religion or god to be co-equal and as true and as important as Christ and Christianity. Now, I repeat that a different way. In other words, his main emphasis is to get Christian people in an organization where they will be brainwashed into thinking that other religions are just as good and isn't it terrible if the other religions are destroyed or fall. And God said, I will famish all the gods of the earth. God talks of the deliverance of Israel in the end of the age to come after the manner of Egypt. And what did he do in Egypt? He destroyed all the gods of Egypt. And Robert Welch says it's a tragedy that these other religions are failing and we're finding less believers in them. Page 61 of Robert Welch. Now the trouble is that in the minds of a vast majority of worshipers, their God had become too close, too concretely defined, and all the details of heaven and hell and of their God's creation and rule of the earth itself had become too vividly and too rigidly put in place. This whole framework of belief could not withstand the sheer facts and convincing rationalizations of the scientific revolution. When Herbert Spencer relegated his own divine being to the infinitely remote and impersonal classification of a first cause, those increasing thousands of intelligent human beings who followed his convincing analysis found that the celestial palace they had built in their minds began to look empty 
unnecessary and perhaps ridiculous. And by the time Ernest Haeckel came to write his Riddle of the Universe, that palace and all the foundations of dogma and doctrine which supported it were crumbling into tragic ruins. For our fathers and their religious preceptors had become too specific and too finite in their beliefs about the infinite, too egocentric and almost patronizing in their adoption of a deity as himself somehow created primarily to be a father of man. When I went to Sunday school in a country Baptist church fifty years ago, I was taught, and with a huge chart on the wall to reinforce the teaching and emphasize its accuracy, that the world was created in 4004 B.C., and I am sure that chart had been drawn in those Sunday school lessons written by good Christians who devoutly believe their own teachings. So far, what he said in 400 words, which should have been said in three or four, is that the Christian teachings could not withstand the findings of science. In other words, science is disproving the Christian teaching. He said it in a nice way, so it didn't make his listeners mad, but in effect that's what he said. A few minutes later he said, Now please do not jump to any conclusion that I want to see Christianity denied, discarded, or even further weakened in the slightest. Exactly the opposite is true, as I hope to make clear when we come back to this subject from the constructive side tomorrow. But I am not in favor of trying to reimpose all or any of the strands of a fundamentalist faith on those whose reason, whether right or wrong, has honestly told them that we cannot know such positive things about the unknowable, and the unknowable here is capitalized. For that would be like trying to tie the waves of the ocean together with ropes or to confine them with fishing nets. So now, on top of saying that science is beginning to destroy Christianity, he now calls God the unknowable. Well, I'm going to read you, out of this large dictionary, what Robert Welch has admitted that he is, in case you haven't caught on. And then we'll go to the scripture. I think I mentioned this before. I use this big book because I don't want someone... I don't want to read uh, the definition out of a small dictionary and then have someone walk in with this 25-pound dictionary later and say, well, Pastor Emery, here's the, here's the real definition. Here's what I read under the definition in Webster's large dictionary under agnosticism. And you listen to this and you see if this fits what I just read out of the blue book. First definition is the doctrine that neither the existence nor the nature of God nor the ultimate origin of the universe is known or knowable. Second definition any doctrine which, while professing belief in God's existence, denies to a greater or less extent the knowableness, K N O W, knowableness of his nature. Third definition any doctrine which affirms the impossibility of any true knowledge as from the belief that all knowledge is relative and therefore uncertain. In other words, that is the doctrine of agnosticism. The doctrine that says that God is unknowable. Now, I would venture to suggest, if there are any John Birch Society members who ever listen to this tape, that nine out of ten John Birch Society members have never caught on and probably would deny to this day that Robert Welch is an agnostic. A man who says, well, yes, there probably is a God, but no man can know him. He is, as he put on page 63, capital U-N-K-N-O-W-A-B-L-E, unknowable. Let's turn over to the Bible again and see what God himself says about the knowing of God. Turn over to Matthew 11, first of all, and we'll start reading in verse 2. Now when John, this John the Baptist, had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? John sent somebody over to Christ, and he said, Are you the Messiah, the Christ? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. In other words, Christ said, you go back and tell John what I'm doing. John will know by my works that I am God, that I am Christ. In other words, we can know God by his works. Verse 27, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, 
and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So we can know the Father by the revelation of the Son. Turn over to the Gospel of John, the 8th chapter, starting in verse 28. Then Jesus said unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then ye shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. So they knew Christ by the hearing of the words of Christ. Now he said that later when he was lifted up, and speaking of his crucifixion, of course they would know that he was the Christ. But right here in the very time when Christ was speaking, it says, many believed on him. In other words, they knew him from the speaking of his words. John 10, in verse 14, Christ says, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. Robert Welch says, God is unknowable. Christ says, my sheep know me. And the word means the same thing, know or knowledge. John 17. And this is the prayer that Jesus prayed. These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. In other words, Jesus Christ came specifically in the things that we've read here, so that we will be able to know God. If we deny in this end of the age that anyone can know God, we in effect are saying that Jesus Christ failed in his ministry, because we, he still is the unknown God. And speaking of the unknown God, turn over to Acts 17, because there were some people back there who worshipped an unknown God. I guess maybe some of you didn't know there were still people worshipping an unknown God, did you? Acts 17, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I pass by and beheld your devotions, and the margin of that indicates that what he saw was their gods, their idols, in other words, statues of their gods, and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. So here we had Paul going up there and coming across these people who had what? Well, they had a number of gods. Robert Welch says uh, people are wonderful who worship Buddha and uh, are Muslims and Jews and Catholics and whatever god they worship, it's all fine and wonderful. Well, here Paul ended up in, uh, on Mars Hill in uh, Greece, in Athens, speaking to people who were identical. They also worshipped many gods, and then to be sure they didn't miss them, <laughs> miss one, they put one special statue up, and they called it to the unknown God. And Robert Wells says, God is unknowable. He calls him, in a type, capital U, the unknowable God. Now, uh, Robert Wells has, and I've already listed these, Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Mohammedans, Buddhists, and then he said, in the gods of all other religions and the one unknown God. And here we find these people did the same thing. And Paul said of them, ye ignorantly worship him. And he also says, ye are too superstitious. So as far as Paul was concerned, he said, you men, you are superstitious and you're ignorant. And that's what you do in ignorance and superstition. You worship an unknown God. And he says, I declare him unto you. And he goes on. And here's the declaration. 1900 years ago. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. He is the creator of all things and hath made of one blood all the nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, 
that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. He isn't some unknown God that we have to put up a statue someplace and label it the unknown God. That's ignorance and superstition. And Paul said, if we seek him, and we will find him. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. You know, Paul was saying, you be careful that you think the Godhead might be... Do you know what the God of uh, the Buddhist is? It's... Uh, a golden statue, a golden idol. And Welch says, that's wonderful, that's fine, we need all these good Buddhists in here. He's 1,900 years late, 1,900 years more ignorant and superstitious than they were back on Mars Hill. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. God allowed this then. That he let it go. But that, that's, Paul was writing almost two millenniums ago, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. God has given assurance unto all men that he is the day of superstition and ignorance is past. The signal was the raising of Christ from the dead. It's done. It was done 1,900 years ago, and it's been in this book for centuries. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. Do you understand which part of this that Robert Welch fits in? He fits in the part of those who mock. Paul summed the whole thing up and said, This unknown God I declare unto you, it is he who raised Christ from the dead. And he can be known because he is not far from you. But what happened? Some mocked. Nineteen hundred years later, we have men still mocking the raising of Christ from the dead and indicating that there are other gods who are just as important as this one who claims the resurrection. Turn over to John 10. Before we leave the resurrection here to see who had the power. John 10, verse 17 and 18. Christ said, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it. This commandment have I received of my Father. In other words, this unknown God is Jesus Christ who had the power to lay down his life and the power of resurrection in himself given from the Father. And Paul told these men so uh, long ago that you men, I understand you're superstitious and I understand you're ignorant and I understand you have all these idols out here and then to protect yourself you've even got one that says an unknown God. And Paul made no nonsense remarks to them about how wonderful it was that they had such true faith in those idols. And the founder of the organization that claims they and they alone are going to save the United States of America from world communism is an advocate of all the gods of the earth. Of all the gods of the earth. Now I want to close by showing... I'm going to close this week, and I'm going to go on next week. I want to close by showing you that it is an anti-Christ philosophy that desires that we think of God as the unknowable. In other words, Satan desires that we think that God cannot be known. And when men begin to find out they can know God, Satan and the Antichrist react against that. Turn over to John 7. And this is an incident that happened, of course, starting in verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. He's in the temple in Jerusalem. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? How come he can talk and explain these things if he hasn't been educated in our universities under us? 
They were marveling at what he was doing. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. In other words, they also were not only, we found they could know God, but they could know his doctrine. Christ said they can know my doctrine. Then in verse 25, Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? Remember, they'd already tried to kill or catch Christ once or twice already. But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man, whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. In other words, these people were saying, well, we know this man. Why, he's the uh, son of Joseph and Mary. When Christ comes, no man will know from whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am. He said, You know me. You know who I am, and you know whence I am. And I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And look what happened. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? In other words, many of them believed on Christ and what? And knew him. Here's the reaction of the Antichrist. The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him. In other words, the people were professing to know that that was Christ. That was God. That was the Messiah, God in the flesh. They were professing knowledge of the one true to God, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. And then they began their deliberate campaign to kill the Son of Glory. The Antichrist immediately react whenever the people recognize that they know God. And they will do anything and everything to try to convince the people that you cannot know God. Don't you know that he is, quote, unknowable? And Robert Welch, the founder of the John Birch Society, has said in his book on page 61, I guess it was, I don't have it open, that we cannot know he who is, quote, unknowable with a capital U. Brother, sister, there's something far deeper in here than he said when he put the phrase at the head of chapter 3, and deeper still. There's something involved in this John Birch organization and the founder of it and the philosophy that is in it that can only be exposed in one manner, by the light of God's Word. Now next week, I'm going to show you that Robert Welsh, later on in the book, states specifically that he believes in evolution. He also writes evolution in there with a capital E and calls it God. And then he proposes that the new world order, which will be built by them after they destroy communism, of course, will be built on, quote, the upward reach in the heart of man. And I'll leave you with this last verse. Psalm 127 and verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. This is Pastor Emery, and sometime after I preached these sermons, I was told by several people that later editions of the Blue Book have Welch's statements on different pages or have omitted them. So you may find it hard to follow with me if you have a later blue book. My edition was the ninth printing, copyright 1961. It is possible that Welch may have felt it necessary to expunge some of his radical statements from the sight of his Christian members. That may explain why many current Members of the John Birch Society simply do not know of Welch's blasphemous remarks about the nature and existence of our God.